Hello and welcome to Your Damn Jets. What I want to do today is uh, continue my story of lymphoma and talk about uh, the treatment that I first received after they diagnosed me. So the story so far is that I had visual problems since January of 2020. I had my attack on June 5th. Um, on November 17th, they did a biopsy and it revealed that I had a primary sinus lymphoma. Um, I remind you that untreated primary sinus lymphoma is a survival time of months. And I had been suffering from that thing for months, so uh, I was ready for uh, treatment. Um, another thing that I learned after uh, I got uh, the lymphoma and I started treatment is that uh, I found an article in the Atlantic that 30 years ago, um, people were dying of this. They were getting a PCS lymphoma and that said, they were they they were sure to die of it. Um, uh, it must have been pretty horrible. Um, and ten years ago, the treatment for it, and this is not in the same article in the same Atlantic article. I found that in a TED talk that somebody had the treatment about 10 years ago and 10 years ago things were experimental for PCNS lymphoma still they were trying to figure out how to treat it and one of the thing that person had that I didn't have is was a intra intrathecal intrathecal I'm not sure how it's pronounced intrathecal uh, metotrexate so they basically had to open up his uh, brain uh, and install a device that allowed them to put um, the chemo directly into his brain. Uh, my chemo was simpler than that. Um, so my treatment was primarily uh, methothrexate based treatment, which is completely different from other lymphomas. Um, I hear about RCHOP or CAR-T for people with other kinds of lymphomas and I had none of that. Mine was methothrexate, the main ingredient. The second ingredient was a toximab. And there was a third ingredient that we ended up scrapping. It was temolizomide, uh, but we scrapped it because it caused neutropenia in me and that wasn't good. Um, and so for my, my chemo, each round, each time I get methotrexate, I have to be admitted. And I've put the little schedule together. There it is. Um, I might just remove myself from the corner so that you can so you can see. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, so my schedule was I had I think initially we had selected eight rounds of methotrexate, um, but I ended up going to the hospital nine times to get my methotrexate, and also. Methotrexate was given every two weeks, so I had some on week one and some on week three and some on week five and week seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and fifteen. Um, and each time that I got the methotrexate, I also got reduximab the next day. Uh, and each time I got the methotrexate, I was at the hospital for about four days. There were a few times where it didn't quite work out that way. But it took me about four days to um, excrete the methotrexate from my blood. And uh, we had um, a fairly um, strict protocol that I needed to be under a certain level to be released from the hospital. And they were checking my blood every day. And sometimes they were checking it twice a day if I was close to the line to, because uh, they wanted me out of there to have the bed for someone else. Um, so yeah, they they tested my blood, and then when when I was back home, uh, I had to also follow a protocol with the toilet uh, to avoid giving chemo to my wife. Um, and so I had uh, rituximab also, and the rituximab was every week for six weeks. Um, so that's why you have week one, I had the methotrexate and the rituximab, and then on week two, I only had the rituximab, and on week three, methotrexate and rituximab, and on week four, only the rituximab, and up to week six, 
where I had my last dose of uh, rituximab. Um, and I also had temolazomide at the start, but we, we stopped it pretty quickly. Uh, so, uh, on November 21st, I started my uh, chemo treatment. Um, and it went pretty well. Unfortunately, my discharge was bungled. And Johns Hopkins doesn't often make make mistake, but sometimes they do make mistake. And um, I was discharged. I had the I still had the catheter from my brain biopsy. And so the oncology unit discharged me with the catheter, and I think they're not used to doing that because first of all I mean I went from biopsy to treatment right away I think usually there's a, a time delay between the two and people are discharged home first from surgery and then they go into oncology to get their treatment I was just rolled internally in the hospital from one place to the other so this discharged me but my catheter is still in and, it, and I needed it in um but they discharged me only with three small bags and the catheter inserted in, you know, where it needs to be. Um, and that was inadequate because when you have a catheter, you have small bags and you have big bags or big containers. And the small bags are there mainly for you to be able to be active during the day. So. If you need to, to walk around the unit to get some exercise or you need to go to a doctor's appointment in, in the hospital, uh, the small bags are too, uh, well, the small bags are, are for that. They're, uh, they're small and you can hide it under, under your, uh, your pants. So it's not a big contrived thing. Otherwise, you have this big thing that you need to carry around. And I guess it's embarrassing for people, I suppose. Um, the problem with the small bags, though, is that they're not adequate for spending the night. Um, I had to get up every three hours at night to empty my small bag. Uh, also, uh, from everything I read on the internet, they say I don't use them at night because they can cause UTIs. Luckily, I didn't have one, but... I was very careful to prevent it. So, you know, they discharged me, they gave me instructions, they didn't give me any kind of su anything substantial about my catheter. I had to find the information on the internet and then I realized I didn't have the right equipment. Um, then I called oncology and urology, but they would not help me either. Them, no, oncology was saying it's urology's responsibility, urology was saying it's oncology's responsibility. Uh, I was in a kind of a service loop there uh, eventually I called my oncologist's office um, and I was served by the nurses there but they were not very helpful they were telling me stuff I already knew like you know I say I have the small bags but I don't have the big bags and then somebody sends me a paragraph that says exactly what I told her like you should not be sleeping with the small bags yeah I already know that that's why I'm talking to you um, on eventually, I was a, the nurse there suggested that next my next infusion at my next infusion for rituximab that I should ask my nurse there to help me with that. And I asked my nurse, and he did help me. He did, he did give me uh, the equipment to change my small bag to a big bag. Um, and that, with all the information I found on the internet um, and a little bit of luck, I was able to finally manage my catheter at home without having to be readmitted to the hospital or anything of the sort. And I ordered more bag on more bags on Amazon on uh, December first. They arrived on December fourth, uh, and from that point on, I was just set. Um, but Johns Hopkins had set me up with Adept Health PCS for getting um, the equipment at home to change my bags. Um, the Adept Health PCS got a call from Johns Hopkins on the 24th of November 
And their stuff arrived on the 5th of December, one day after the Amazon stuff, which for me is way too long to be without the equipment that you need. Um, so I don't do any business with Adaptel PCS uh, anymore. I've, I've blocked them from my phone. I don't talk to them. Um, they've been sending me stuff from time to time or calling or over. Those guys were not on the ball at all with getting my supplies here. I am not dealing with them at all. I, you know, whatever they sent me, I still have, but otherwise, uh, I don't talk to them. Um, so yeah, the first, my first um, discharge from chemo was, I think, a bit of a disaster. Discharge wise, the chemo was fine. The discharge was not great. Uh, and I did complain to John Ho Johns Hopkins about that. I wrote a formal letter and I sent them to their complaint department. And uh, then the, the next time I was in the, for chemo, uh, there's a nurse that came in and, you know, she talked to me. And so I think, I hope this will not happen anymore when people are wheeled from one department to the other. Because I really think that the oncology department didn't quite, know how to handle me for the discharge uh, whereas if i had been discharged from the neurology department and they would have done all the work necessarily necessary for uh, you know make sure that i had the right equipment at home for the catheter um so on december 12 uh, no not december 12th december 2nd I started taking timolozomide, and I told you that that's the one that we eventually uh, stopped uh, stopped using. Uh, I I took it with an antiemetic, and the nurses were saying, "Well, pe some people don't need the antiemetic at all. They just take the medicine, and they don't have any nausea. Uh, some people can take a lower dose of the antiemetic than what we prescribe, and some people have to take the full dose." So I started the full dose. And I slowly tapered the antiemetic, and it turned out at the end that I didn't need it. Uh, I was just, I, I, there was some instruction about eating two hours before you take the pills to make sure to help yourself not be nauseous. And I just did that, and I was not nauseous. Um, then on December 6th, I had my second round of uh, methotrexate um, and I had a late start because my bilirubin was elevated and it was uh, spooking the oncologists. Uh, and I've always had elevated bilirubin, so I'm not sure, I don't know how it works. You know, why do you have to delay if the patient has elevated bilirubin. My bilirubin is always elevated when I have a blood test. Always elevated bilirubin. Is it you have jaundice? I don't look yellow. So I don't know. I don't know. And nobody has figured out why it's that way. And it doesn't seem to be doing anything bad to me. Um, on December 9th, um, I had a meeting with my oncologist and he showed me two slides. In one slide you could see the tumor and on the other slide there was nothing. And he told me after two rounds of chemo, your tumor is gone. Uh, so I was happy that the tumor disappeared so quickly. Uh, but it made no difference to my treatment. <laughs> Uh, it's just the way the way it's organized. Uh, you know, it's eight rounds of methotrexate and then whatever goes around it, and it doesn't change. Like I think the tumor could have gone the first round of chemo and it would still have given me eight rounds. It's just the way it works, the way the system works. They want to to go through the whole treatment and not stop it early. I guess people can put their foot down and say, "Well, I want to stop early." But my oncologist didn't recommend it. Oh, and I should also say that, uh, oh boy, I don't remember the name, but there's a national, there's a national cancer organization. I, I don't, I think it's NNC, N, NCCN. I'm not sure about the name. Maybe I'll have it for next time. I forgot to look it up again. Um, 
But those guys have put out a guide for people with primary sinus lymphoma. They don't have guides for everything. They have, I think they do have treatment guides made for doctors for just about every cancer. But for patients, it's more limited. But they happen to have um, PCNS lymphoma guide for the patient. And I wish I had that at the time that my doctors were talking about treatment and you know, should we start and uh, stuff like that. But in the end, it, it, I don't think it would have made any difference because I got what the guide recommends, which is the methotrexate chemo and then the stem cell transplant later. Um, and I've looked for the, some guide like that for people with other cancers because I'm, I try to help people online as much as possible. I'm on Discord and I'm a moderator. And sometimes somebody comes with a cancer and I try to find the, the guide for them. And some cancers don't have th that guide. It's, it's, it's a bit sad. I can find the, the doctor's guide, but I cannot find the patient's guide. Um, so hopefully, eventually, they're going to cover all the cancers for, for patients. Because the doctor guide, I can look at it and I, you know, I, I can read the words. and I, But it's very complicated and it, I don't think... It's good for patients to look at the doctor's guide if they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, on December 11th, I uh, around this, I, I, it might have been on December 11th. I don't know when it is exactly, but I decided to, to fire my old my old cardiologist. Um, and there were multiple reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons was that when I talked to him about the PCSK9 inhibitor, actually I didn't talk to him about that. He learned about it because the Johns Hopkins made the minor mistake of sending the paperwork that they should have sent to my primary care physician, they sent it to my cardiologist. So my cardiologist knew that I was getting on a PCSK9 inhibitor because John Hopkins made a mistake. So when he learned that I was getting on a PCS K9 inhibitor, he, he looked at me and he said, oh yeah, the paperwork for those is hard. Um, and after, you know, leaving the office and thinking about it, it's like, what the hell? I've, I've seen you for five years. Um, and uh, PCS scan inhibitor is not a very old medicine. It's been approved maybe five years ago. So I understand if the doctor is not like right away gets me on the medicine, but five years without that medicine, um, because the paperwork is difficult, it's like, you're a doctor, you should, it, do what you need to get me the best care possible. Johns Hopkins, when I saw the doctor there, the lipid specialist, it was right away you get on the PCS K9 inhibitor. We're going to do it. And I think my insurance refused it at first, but then they accepted it because there was some paperwork missing. or I don't know what, what the problem was exactly. I let them figure it out. But the doctor that I had here, the cardiologist that I had here, it's like he has the same information, same medical history, same problem, same thing, same everything. And while it's, you know, it's hard to, f to fill the paperwork for that. It's like, what the hell? So that was one thing. The other thing with the cardiologist is like, I know I kept getting in the hospital and I, I, and sometimes I had to cancel appointments with him because I was in the hospital and I couldn't see him. Um, and then it takes so long, so like it would take one, two months before I saw him again. Um, and the, the cherry that, that made everything crash was um, the, the office gave me an appointment on December 31st, so New Year's Eve. And then they call me. Uh, no, they don't call me, actually. They send me a letter saying that that appointment was canceled and I should reschedule. Once I had all of that under my hat, I said, I'm not seeing this guy anymore. I'm going to find a cardiologist at Johns Hopkins. So on December 20, uh, on December 11th, I called Johns Hopkins to make an appointment with a cardiologist that had never seen me before. 
They say we have an opening on the 14th. It's like three days from the time I call Johns Hopkins, they have an appointment available for me. So, I, why should I stay with the, the doctor that I'm with? I'm this, These guys can do their appointments much faster. So I dumped my old cardiologist. Um, and now I have a, I have a lipid specialist at Johns Hopkins and I have a cardiologist also. Um, and that makes all the difference. Uh, you know, so at, at that point, I had at that point I had fired the ophthalmologist that I had seen at the start of my lymphoma problems. I had fired all the doctors associated with the hospital, uh, you know, the neurologist that they gave me, and I went to see the neurologist and so on and so forth. I had fired them. I was not seeing them anymore. I had fired my primary care physician, who was like f maybe five minutes away from my house. I decided that five minutes away was, well, it's, it's very nice to have the doctor five minutes away from the house, but I was not getting the proper care that I needed, so I switched to a Johns Hopkins primary care physician. I fired my cardiologist. Um, and right now I'm not seeing anyone who's not associated with Johns Hopkins anymore, I think. Um, my psychiatrist and my... Um, Psychologists were are with Blue Ridge uh, because Johns Hopkins will not see me for mental health. I mean, I don't know, there's some nonsense rule. Maybe someday I'll talk about that, but they couldn't they couldn't see me. Um, so as we as we speak, the only people I would still see if I needed to would be my psychiatrist and my psychologist that are local and not associated with Johns Hopkins. Otherwise, all the doctors I see are uh, associated with Johns Hopkins. The gastroenterologist that went on this well good ch good, uh, goose chase about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, well, they did their job, but and they say, well, you should do a a colonoscopy eventually. But I don't, I don't want to do it with them. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Johns Hopkins, and if I need to drive, I'm going to drive to Johns Hopkins, and I'm going to have them do it, uh, not the doctors here. Uh, so, uh, and again, I'm going to, to sound like a broken record, um, that, uh, as far as lessons learned are concerned, um, get a second opinion, be on the ball with the quality of your care. If you feel that one doctor is not giving you what you need, and especially if it's not giving you what you need for stupid reasons, then switch doctors, um. It can make all the difference in the world. And for me, it didn't make the difference switching cardiologists. My PCS K9 inhibitor is the key to controlling my cholesterol. With the medicines I was taking before, my cholesterol was okay, considering the fact that I have familial hypercholesterolemia. With the PCS K9 inhibitor, my cholesterol is perfect, for the exception of the... It's the HDL I think you need to raise, uh, but there's no drug on the market that can raise the, the good cholesterol. So this is as good as it gets. Um, and if you're hospitalized somewhere or if you are working with a team somewhere that you think you should be continuing to work with and there are problems like the problems I had with my discharge at Johns Hopkins, speak up i spoke enough for that i spoken up about other problems at johns hopkins like with dining and with billing um and i got some traction on, on that too um uh, billing more than the dining services i may have a video eventually about dining services which is going to be very pretty depressive because they usually are terrible um but if something doesn't go your way speak up and you know, sometimes people are afraid of speaking up. Like, if I speak up, the nurses are going to hate me or somebody's going to hate me. I've never felt that there was somebody, you know, in the long term. Maybe there's somebody coming in and talking to me at one point and then I feel like the interaction is not great. But I've never felt long term like, you know, that they knew, the nurses all knew that I had complained and they were against me. It wasn't like that. 
Uh, and even sometimes you have different persons that, depending on what you complain about that can come and talk to you after the fact to try to you know find a solution or say we heard you. Uh, and then with some people, sometimes the communication doesn't seem to be going very well. Uh, but I've had people come into my office and to my not my office my uh, my room at the hospital and be very apologetic about what happened and telling me we're going to put in place the training and the resources to prevent that from happening anymore. Um, and I it felt genuine that those people were you know really caring about the quality of the service that they give and uh, realize that what happened was was not okay. Um, so I, I, I invite people to speak up when things don't work out the way they want um, because that's, that's how you can get things to change. Uh, so, so this was part of my treatment. I'm going to have another video. Uh, the next video is going to continue talking about my treatment, but I think uh, 26 minutes, uh, excuse me, 26 minutes, uh, it's enough. Uh, so I'm um, going to end it here and say goodbye and see you in the next